But what really got me interested in cover crops is the fact that probably the number one problem that we see, uh, particularly with vegetable crops, is we've got issues with our soils. And it doesn't really matter where you go in the world, people have problems with soil. Um, what will happen a lot of times, uh, soils will be just farmed and farmed and farmed and they're not really putting much back into those soils. They're not putting organic matter in them. You're, they're not uh, keeping track of the nutrients and all those sorts of things. Everything gets all kind of fouled up and they, you know, you tell them, well, hey, try this crop because it'll grow anywhere. And they'll say, we tried that one, it won't grow. And it's like, so really soil is a huge, big deal, okay? And um, no joke, if you get your soil in the right kind of condition, you can grow a lot of things. You can grow almost anything. If your soil is in bad condition, uh, it's... Uh, doesn't have the right pH balance, it doesn't have the nutrients that the plant needs, it doesn't have the organic matter that we need in the soil, it doesn't have the, the, let's call it biological life in that soil that we really need to have in order for it to be healthy, we're going to have problems trying to grow crops. And you say, well, I'm a cattleman, I'm not worried about that. Well, the thing is, is cattle eat grass, right? Or they eat, they eat plants. And so we still, we're back to the soil. The soil is where everything really originates. So that's, that's how I got into working a little bit on cover crops. So why consider cover crops? I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, we have lots of clean tillage that goes on in the vegetable business because guess what? A lot of our crops don't compete very well with weeds. So we you know, we may have a tractor and a cultivator. We may have, we may use uh, clean plowing and then getting ground ready where it's, it's uh, nice bare soil, it's nice and clean and, and trying, trying to give our crops the best start they can without having to compete with weeds from day one. So we have this clean tillage that we use a lot. But soils in the southern part of the United States, I, I've got southern plains up there, it's really not un that unusual to see soils that have less than 1% organic matter in the soils. And you say, well, so, well, if you go to some place like Nebraska or the Dakotas or Wyoming or some place that's really cold, you'll find soils that have four, five, six percent organic matter in them. And it's because they have this nice long winter. And, uh, <clears throat> The microbes, the microbial life in the soil that breaks down organic matter, uh, does not work during those months when it's really cold. You know, they go to Florida, they go to Disney World, they go, you know, they, they go all sorts of places, but they're not working during those really cold months. That, compared to where we're at in the world, and, you know, microbes in Oklahoma might be able to have one morning off to go to the coffee shop. The rest of the time, they're working all the time, all through the winter. So that's, that's the problem right there, is we've got these uh, bacteria and fungi that break down organic matter, and they really don't get a day off in this part of the world. And as you go further south, they, get even, they don't even get a trip to the coffee shop. I mean, they just work, work, work. And so because of that, it's easy, particularly when we're tilling soils on a regular basis, which adds oxygen to the soil. And that's kind of like hitting the turbo on your car. My wife's got this tiny little car. It's got this tiny little engine in it. It's got a turbo. And boy, when you step on it, things happen. That's the way uh, aerating the soil through tillage makes those microbes work that much faster. So those two things coupled together, a long warm season and then tillage when we end up with soils that are half of one percent to seven tenths of a percent and that's not that odd of a number. That's pretty normal in this part of the world. So that's that's not a good thing. So why is that a problem? Well we have problems. We have reduced drainage in the soil, the internal drainage, because those uh, 
organic matter particles help to make pore spaces, make space within the soil so we can get air and water into it. So that's, that's a problem. We have problem uh, with the microbes because guess what? They don't have anything to eat. So your population of beneficial microbes goes down, okay? And trust me, I'm not trained to be an organic gardener, but I'm just telling you the way it, it works. You know, you gotta have some organic matter. Uh, it also lowers our ability to hold moisture and plant nutrients. Uh, if you've got soil that doesn't have organic matter in it, it does not have the pore space it needs for that water to go into, so you can't hold as much moisture, and the moisture will not penetrate the soil as far down. So, you know, like you get a, a rain, you get, let's say we get a, a nice rain, we get an inch, inch and a half rain. If we don't have any organic matter in the soil, after a few minutes, that soil is pretty much soaked up all it's going to, and the rest of it just runs off and ends up in the ditch and the pond and the river, and so on and so forth. Whereas if we had more organic matter in that soil, it would accept a lot more water and store it in the soil where we really want it to be stored at. So that's, that's a positive if we can overcome this lack of organic matter. And then plant nutrients, uh, gee, I spent about four years in East Texas and at the front end of my career, and they had two different soil types in East Texas. They had what they called sugar sands, which I didn't even call them that. I called them silicon dioxide because there was nothing in those soils. I mean, it was just, it was like beach sand was about what it was like. And, uh, and then they also had really heavy clays. So the first summer that we gardened, uh, of course, when you're the county horticulturist, you know, the pressure's on, folks. I'm telling you, you got to have a garden. It's got to be successful, okay? That's just the way it is. And uh, the first summer that we gardened, we had a really, we had one of those sugar sands, that's what we had. And I tell you, I had to water almost every day, had to fertilize once a week, and it was just like pulling teeth to get that garden to grow. But, you know, we, we were quote unquote successful, okay? <laughs> Made it through the first year. So after that first year, I had a friend that had a horse stable, and I said, Don, have you got any horse manure? And, you know, I mean, he goes like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I got lots of horse manure. And so um, he says, you'd bring your, I had a little, I did not have a pickup truck. Then I had the classic uh, pickup bed, two-wheel trailer, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, really classy looking thing, you know. He says, you bring your trailer over and leave it with me, and when it's full, I'll call you and you can come get it. So I started hauling manure, horse manure, and, and you know, all the stall shavings and all that other stuff, and putting it in the garden. So after about a year of doing that, I probably put six to eight loads in my little garden, pickup bed fulls, and uh, worked that in. The next year, it was like a totally different soil. It would hold water. I could water once a week. I mean, can you imagine going from once a day to once a week? I could fertilize, if I, if I needed to, I could fertilize about once a month, which isn't very often compared to once a week. And things got much, much better, okay? So that's just a little story of what organic matter can do for you. So we lose a lot of production from that. Uh, so we're really here to talk about cover crops, and uh, so the nice thing about cover crops is we have some advantages. We also have some disadvantages, but one advantage is, is that we don't have to go get this stuff. We can grow it in place, okay? So it's kind of like grow your own organic matter in the field where it's going to be used, rather than buying it from somebody or shipping it from somewhere or you know, trucking it in or whatever you got to do, okay? You don't have to compost it. That's kind of nice. Uh, I know that uh, composting is a great way to add organic matter to soils, but if you're talking about commercial production, let's say you're talking about an acre or more of soil that you're trying to manage, and if you're going to compost all the material that's going to go onto that acre, that's a lot of compost, folks. And it's a lot of work, 
I mean, you got to turn it, you got to check it, and you know, it's it's almost like having livestock, you know, not quite as much work, but close, you know. So you don't have to do that. Uh, you don't have to worry about how I'm going to spread it evenly on the field, because guess what? It's you just got to get it chewed up and put in the soil. And then the other thing is we don't have to worry about food safety issues because we don't have to worry about how long has it been since I applied manure or anything like that. We don't have to worry about all those quote unquote food safety uh, contaminants that we might have problems with in a, if we're using raw manure because it's not raw manure, it's just plant material. So that's kind of nice. Uh, bottom line, Really, cover crops are a little bit easier. Uh, they can be less involved, especially compared to composting or, or traveling around and getting all this stuff and putting it on the soil. But there is a problem. We've got, we've got that land out of production when we're growing cover crops. So if you're thinking about, you know, I, I need to be profitable, you know, I'm, we're not talking about a huge farm here, but let's say that you've got half an acre, how much of that are you willing to give up in order to be able to grow, grow cover crops in that area and then rotate back around to it? Because it's going to be out of production for a while. And that's, that's kind of, everything's got pluses and minuses, you know? We got, <laughs> we got the pluses, but that's one thing that's a problem with cover crops is that land is going to be out of production for a little while. Okay, some benefits. There are lots of benefits from cover crops. Um, we can save uh, money on the fertilizer bill. Um, you know, if we're using legumes like, uh, let's say, clovers or, or other types of legumes that can fix nitrogen out of the air and fix that into the plant material and then we plow that into the ground and the nitrogen gets released, that saves a lot of money. And if you're an organic, grower, that's a great way to get some nitrogen for your crop because that's kind of the, the diciest part of organic growing as far as fertility goes is where do I get nitrogen? You know, if you're buying fish oil emulsion or something like it costs a lot of money. And if you can start off with 50 or 60 or 100 pounds of nitrogen already in that soil ready to go, that saves a lot of money in an organic system, but it also saves money in a in a uh, conventional system. The other thing about uh, cover crops is, uh, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about this as we go, but uh, nitrogen particularly wants to just uh, go ahead and, and get to, it runs right on down through the soil profile and goes on down when it rains. And, uh, and in some ways, phosphorus and potassium will do that, calcium and and potassium will do that, okay? Not near like nitrogen, but a little bit. So cover crops can actually, if you've got deep-rooted cover crops, they can go down there and grab a hold of those elements and bring them up into the plant, and then guess what? Instead of being four foot down, they're in the plow layer. They're in that layer of soil that we want to grow plants in. So we can actually kind of mine those nutrients back up to the surface where we need them. Uh, herbicides. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we, could, we could spend probably an hour talking about is weed control using cover crops. Uh, because, guess what? We're not picking crops that are, gonna have a that are going to have trouble competing with the weeds, okay? You know, you, you, you plant hay grazer in the summertime, and guess what? It's hard for pig weeds to outgrow hay grazer. You know, hay grazer gets, what, eight, 10 foot tall. I mean, and it grows like crazy. So you've got this little broadleaf weed that's like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen the sun in six weeks, you know? <laughs> so it outcompetes, it reduces the amount of, of seed that that weedy species would create in that season. So you're reducing your bank of weed seeds, which is, that's always a good thing. Uh, it can shade out a lot of weeds that we can't control uh, unless we use chemicals, like we can use hay grazer to, to uh, shade out Bermuda grass. You know, that's its only really weak point Bermuda's got is it's got to have lots of sunlight. Well, you cut off its sunlight and it's like, 
I'm dying, you know, I'm having a rough time here. So uh, cover crops can do that. One of the pictures I've got here, this middle picture, is actually uh, a uh, picture of some mustard. And they have actually bred mustards that have high levels of compounds that when they break down, it's kind of like uh, biofumigation. And so that can reduce viable weed seed in a, in a crop. If you grow a cover crop like this, uh, mustard, until it starts to flower, and then you just you uh, chew it all up with a brush hog or a, a flail mower or something, and then you disc it into the soil, then all that, that uh, biofumigant gets released and actually will reduce the amount of weeds that are going to grow in that. So it's, it's a naturally occurring system. Uh, it can be used in an organic system. Uh, also, those biofumigants will control, <coughs> excuse me, will control a lot of critters that we might have trouble with. They'll help reduce the number of nematodes and, and fungi and, and bacteria that are harmful. So that's a good thing. Um, if you, you're growing cover crops, if you've ever grown cowpeas in the summertime, you notice that, I mean, there's all sorts of creatures that are working these flowers. And a lot of those creatures uh, that are in those flowers are beneficial insects. And that's a good thing. Uh, that can reduce the amount, if you're a conventional grower, the amount of spraying that you might need to do if you'll think about it and protect those, those beneficials. Uh, and if you're an organic grower, it's a great way to help boost the amount of beneficial insects that are, in, in, that are on your land and protecting your plants. So that's a good thing. Uh, we got our little friend, the, the nematode here. This is kind of a, a picture in a, uh, using a microscope, probably electron microscope. But uh, So having organic matter in that soil helps encourage the critters that might help to control a pathogenic uh, bug like retinot nematode. It's not going to totally cut it off at the pass, but it will reduce its, its uh, population. Okay, some other benefits. <coughs> Cover crops will help to prevent uh, erosion, okay? And we really are talking here about two things, wind and water. Uh, you know, if you've got a nice cover on the, on the ground, like this, this whole field looked like this before we got ready to plant cabbage um, a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, if you've got a cover like this, so what if it rains six inches? That soil's not going anywhere. It's held tightly by those plants, and uh, you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to float down and, and end up in in the lake somewhere or the river. It's gonna stay put, so it helps prevent that. Uh, and when it comes to wind, uh, you know, we lived in South Texas for about eight years. That was right along, along the border, you know, they, and the border's been in the news a lot lately. And that's where we were at. And uh, they thought they had wind, you know, a, a normal day to be, oh, 15 to 30 miles an hour. You know, and they had some wind. Thank goodness. You know, wind is our, actually our friend, okay? <laughs> so, but when we moved back up to Oklahoma, you know, 30 mile an hour, is that wind? No, that's a breeze, right? Right. You know, when we start getting up in 50, 60, you know, in the spring, we'll get days where we've got 60, 70 mile an hour gusts. If you've got all this strips of cover crop and you've got this nice tender plants that you just transplanted and you've got this there, it's like those plants are like, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I'm not getting blown to death because I've got something protecting me from the wind. Uh, the other thing that we'll do, we'll also keep the soil in place, but it's a lot easier on your plants when you've got strips of cover between, you know, maybe two or three rows and then you've got another strip of cover crop that you left to protect it from the wind. So there's some great things that cover crops can do. Uh, we can improve the health of our soils and improve our yields. Uh, we've already kind of hit on this speeding water infiltration. So 
One of the, uh, I don't think we've got a picture to, in, this, in this slide, but there is a picture of, of a research farm that I used to work on quite a bit. And it's never had cover cropping. It's, it's really low in organic matter. It's been tilled and tilled and tilled and tilled. And it has a plow layer. And, uh, you know, when it rains, you'd think uh, one, one year we had a field day there, and it had rained three or three and a half inches the night before the field day. And we thought, oh, my goodness. And guess what? About that far down, about six or eight inches down, it was like concrete. You could run through there, and because none of that water went down, it just, and it all kind of just sapped and it was gone. You know, by the time we got around to the evening when we had the field day, you could actually walk on it without going, you know, I mean, it was pretty amazing. But that's not what we want. We want that soil to actually suck up and hold that moisture rather than having it all just drain off. And that's one thing organic matter does. Uh, it will also reduce compaction. Uh, if you've got deep-rooted uh, crops that you're, you're using as cover crops, uh, we use a, 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 it's called a tillage radish. It's just a big old radish that might get maybe that long. And we plant that in the fall. Hopefully we get it planted early enough and then it, it, its root, taproot goes way down there. And then guess what? It gets knocked out by the first frost, but it opens up this big hole and allows water to go enter on in there. And it will also help to break up plow pans or hard, hard pan, okay? So that's, that's a great thing. Uh, it definitely can increase soil mo microbes. We've talked about that a little bit. And then, again, helps this nutrient cycling, which is if you've got this land and you've got potassium or calcium that has gone down or nitrogen that's gone down and you've got a deep-rooted crop, it'll pull that material up out of that subsoil and bring it up into the plant. And then it's, guess what? It's back on the surface where your crops can use it again. So, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, here's just some potential cover crops that you might consider, and this is not an extensive list. Uh, I also brought, I think there's about 30 of these books. They're over there on the table, and they're free for you guys to take home. If you want one, uh, grab it on the way out. It's called Managing Cover Crops Profitably. So this has got a lot of information uh, about how to use cover crops, but it also has a lot of information about all the different types of cover crops that you might want to consider trying. So this is a really good source of information. So anyway, back to this. Um, of course, we use winter wheat. I mean, wheat's a big, big thing in the state, and it's readily available, and it's pretty inexpensive as a cover crop seed. Uh, we also use cereal rye. Uh, that's another one that we're using. Uh, these are cool season annual grasses, basically, is what we're talking about. I mean, that we use them for grain in agronomic farming, but we can use them for cover crops. Then uh, also during the winter, we can use a couple of legumes. Uh, we use Austrian winter pea and crimson clover. Uh, I just love crimson clover because it's so darn pretty. You know that... The cover slide with those pretty red flowers, that's crimson clover. Just a beautiful plant. But it'll also fix a lot of nitrogen, nitrogen and so will Austrian winter pea. Now, the interesting thing is the, the grasses will add a lot. I mean, they're champions at adding organic matter. But they really stink when it comes to nitrogen because they use nitrogen, and then sometimes, you know, when you grind this stuff up and then plow it into the soil, the nitrogen that's in the soil kind of gets locked up because you've got this high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you might have a 60 to 1 or 50 to 1 or 40 to 1 ratio of carbon to nitrogen, and what you want to do is it's the microbes that break that down in the soil use nitrogen, and they're in the queue. They're the front end of the line. They get it first, and then when they're done with it, the plant gets it. So you can have some trouble if you're just using just grasses, but they're fantastic, really, for adding organic matter. Okay, the legumes, uh, Austrian winter pea, crimson clover in the wintertime. Uh, legumes have this special 
symbiotic relationship with a, with a bacteria. It's called a rhizobium bacteria. And every legume has a specific bacteria that it works with. And so the bacteria can actually take nitrogen out of the air and out of the air that's in the soil and fix it so the plant can use that nitrogen. Then that nitrogen stays in the plant until the plant's plowed back in the soil. Then it gets released. So that's, that's kind of a neat trick that nature's done for us. Uh, in the summer, we use uh, some pearl millet. It's kind of like hay grazer, except it's kind of like hay grazer that's a little less crazy. You know, hay grazer will get 10 or 12 foot tall. Uh, pearl millet might get five or six foot tall. So it's, it's a little, little less. We use hay grazer. And then uh, in the summer, we use cowpea as our legume. So a lot of times what we're doing is we're mixing grasses and legumes together because you kind of get more bang for your buck that way. It's a great way to go. Um, I have tried some uh, more exotic uh, legumes. Uh, we tried sesbania, and we tried uh, lab lab. And compared to cowpea, they're very much more expensive, and they're wimps. They are really wimpy. Compared, cow peas like it hasn't rained for eight weeks and it's been 100 degrees and it just sits there and it just says, I'm good. And some of these other summer legumes, when you get, you know, two, three weeks into that, that droughty and hot period, they're like, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying. I, you know, I got to have a drink, I got to have a drink. And it's like, what a bunch of wimps, you know, just leave them. Leave them at the store, that's what I think. <laughs> they're expensive and they just, but there are probably some other summer legumes that might work as well as cowpea, but that's the best I've found so far. And if you're gonna use cowpea, just get a forage type like iron clay or, or red ripper or something like that. Uh, pretty common and, and available locally. Okay, so grasses or legumes, hmm. This, this was part of a, uh, a uh, cover crop study that we did with winter cover crops. This is a pea clover mix. Uh, this is just straight winter wheat. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of a combination. We did actually have a combination, but uh, this is really to prove a point. Why is this? These pictures were taken on the same exact day with the same camera about the same distance from the plots, okay? But look. Look at that. That's probably eight or ten foot across. This is probably maybe four foot across. We probably got double the growth. Why is that? That's because those legumes set a lot of nitrogen during the winter, and that nitrogen was sitting there waiting to help that pumpkin crop grow. So does this stuff work? Yeah, it really does. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, saw particularly this last spring was we had, I think we had uh, Austrian winter pea mixed in with winter wheat. And, uh, you know, those peas actually climbed up on top of that wheat to get to the sunlight, and there they were. They were up, I mean, what a neat symbiotic thing that's going on with that. You know, you've got the wheat for the organic matter, you've got the pea that's going to make the, fix the nitrogen, and One's helping the other, so it, it was pretty cool. Okay, uh, so rotations and cover crops. You want to think about the type of production system you've got or you're going to use. Uh, if you haven't figured out yet, we're doing a lot of strip tilling. We're not tilling up the entire field. We're leaving strips of cover crop in there and letting it just go ahead and mature out. Uh, so far, knock on wood, we haven't really had a cover crop become a weed problem. Uh, I mean, the wheat turns into wheat, the rye turns into rye, uh, we've got clover seed and all that, but when those are winter cover crops go to seed and you're, you're uh, planting your crops that you're going to plant in the summertime, you think, well, it's going to be a weed. Well, it comes up, but it hardly grows at all because guess what? It's really out of the place it wants to be. It doesn't want to be hot and dry. It wants to be cool and wet. And so they come up, but they just kind of sit there, and it's almost like a living mulch on the soil surface. So 
I haven't had a real problem with that. Okay, so, um, so type of production system, I mean, if you're gonna clean till, that's, that's one, one way to approach it, or strip till. Uh, you can get a roller crimper and lay this stuff down and use it as a quote unquote living mulch. Uh, I'm still trying to work that one out. I tried that one year and got, we got a good stand of watermelons on it. I would think something, a vine crop would be the thing to go with in that kind of a system. But I had a terrible time trying to get weed control because uh, you know, once it laid down, then all the pigweeds and everything else came up. So it, it was a little bit challenging. I haven't done that since then, but may return to that eventually. Okay, uh, so you wanna match to the field and rotations. In other words, uh, you know, if you grew all brassicas in a field, you probably wouldn't wanna come back with another brassica like mustard, okay? You'd probably wanna go to something else. Uh, herbicide history, if you're conventional farming and you're using herbicides in your crops, you wanna make sure that you're following those waiting periods between application and the crop that you're gonna use as a cover crop. So any pesticide label will list, okay, it should be two months or immediate, or you gotta wait a year before you plant this, this other crop. Just read the label and, and keep track of that. That way you're not wasting seed in, in your efforts. Uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I think that you know, if you can work these things into a rotation, say for one, one summer that you might be growing cover crops on a, one spot, and then the next summer you come back and then you're growing crop in that crop, in that uh, land that you grew the cover crop in the previous year. So just, it's a matter of trying to schedule this stuff. Uh, so depends on the time of the year when we're talking about winter or summer. Uh, we've already talked about grasses. We've talked about it can tie up nitrogen. Uh, legumes can be a good source of nitrogen. Uh, if you've never inoculated a legume and this is the first time you've grown it, you need to make sure you put inoculum with the seed. Otherwise, it may not fix any nitrogen because you've got to have both there. You've got to have the bacteria and you've got to have the, the legume seed. So keep that in mind. We usually just inoculate every time. And uh, so, that, see, of course, that works. But uh, So we've talked a little bit about this deep-rooted uh, cover crops, and they can help to break up hard pans, that sort of thing. So tilth and fertility. A tilth has really got to do with how that soil works. And uh, I'm an old farm boy. You can kind of figure that out, you know. <laughs> haven't got a lick of sense, sort of stuff like that. But the thing is, is tilth really has to do with how well the soil particles are, are glued together. How it's, it's called uh, how, they, how, how they're aggregated, stuck together. And when they're stuck together and you've got bigger particles because they're, each individual particles are stuck together, it makes it easier to till. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, everybody, I got, at least I got Leon shaking his head, so I'm good. Okay, so um, we've got uh, two types. We've got uh, an active part of, of organic matter, and that would be like legumes. You know, they have a lot of moisture in them, they have a lot of sugars, they have protein. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, and that's kind of like candy to these microbes, because they're like, Oh man, got some good stuff, you know, and they get excited and, and the microbial life will, will go up very fast. Now that, that sounds great and it is good, but it doesn't last very long because it's kind of like candy. You kind of blow on through it and then, you know, those potatoes and that meat you had for lunch, that's what's holding you four hours later. And it kind of works this way with the, the active or the, these ones that have lots of sugars in them. Now, when we go to the stable stuff, it's woodier, more fibrous, and that's really like the, the grasses. A lot of cellulose, a lot of lignin, a lot of carbon, and that's a good thing too to have that because it means it's something that's going to last a lot longer in the soil than say a legume. Does that make sense to everybody, I hope. So uh, what the soil gets from the active and the stable ones, these sugars that are in, in these active ones help to glue these soil particles together to get them to aggregate. 
okay? And the root exudates, in other words, the roots of these cereal grains exude or put out different kinds of compounds, and those compounds are what causes particles to aggregate, to stick together, meaning we're going to have better drainage, we're going to have better aeration, all those things that we're going to gain from that. So that's just a little bit about the two different types of organic matters. Uh, nutrient management. So uh, cover crops, like we already talked a little bit about, is they can soak up nitrogen, they can soak up uh, some other uh, plant nutrients that the plant needs and bring them up to the surface of the soil. So that's, that's a really handy thing to be able to do. And they slow the amount, they slow water down as it passes through the soil. So, you know, if you're a, a molecule of nitrogen and you get, you get at least like, you know, when you go to the restroom and you flush the toilet and that water comes boiling out of there real fast, I mean, that nitrogen just goes right on down through there. But if the water is slower as it goes through there, it's not going to leach as much nitrogen on down into the subsoil. So that's a good thing. Uh, cover crops, uh, we've talked about calcium and potassium being mined. Uh, and because we have this increased biological activity in the soil, phosphorus availability goes up. It, ma it makes it where the plant can get a hold of it and use it better. So there are some real things to gain. And then legumes can encourage mycorrhizae, which this is a little picture of some mycorrhizae, which basically is a fungus. And, uh, you know, in the last few years, uh, people have gone to the, well, I'm going to call it the beauty shop and everybody will laugh, but anyway, and they got hair extensions. You know what I'm talking about? You know, like you got hair like mine, so you put extensions and then you got hair like this. So mycorrhizae are kind of like hair extensions for roots. And so instead of having just the root system, now you've got maybe 10, 100 times more surface to grab a hold of nutrients and get them into the plant. So it's one of those symbiotic relationships again. We're actually uh, working with uh, uh, Gail Wilson, who's a professor in uh, not plant and soil science, but it's environmental science at OSU, and uh, they're measuring the amount of, of mycorrhizae that we have in our cow peas in a cow pea trial. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. So here's uh, sources of information. We've already talked about this one, but this is another book. It's called Building Soils for Better Crops. These are SARE publications. Uh, and SARE is a, is a group of people that just do a lot of neat things for sustainable types of agriculture. And they've got a lot of good information. Uh, you know, I kind of, this is kind of my cover crop Bible, okay? And that other one's kind of my soils Bible. It's, it, they're great books. Uh, if I can understand it, anybody can. So they're good sources of, of information. How's that sound? All right, thanks for listening to me. Have a nice evening.